Hello, I'm Jared Marks and I'm a professor of emergency medicine at the University of Nebraska Medical Center. I often teach under the pseudonym Pocus Geek on YouTube and in other venues. And today I'm going to be talking to you about the eFAST exam. Clearly this is a play on words, but this is it is important that we perform this exam quickly. But it's also important that we perform it well because this is a diagnostic exam that can indicate to us therapies that our patients will need. The primary objective of this exam is to identify bleeding. Now bleeding is a secondary sign to, to a primary cause. So bleeding is the secondary issue. The primary issue is that we have a solid organ injury. And what we're gonna be looking for is anechoic or black areas on the ultrasound that indicate to us that there is fluid collection, which we assume is uh, bleeding in our patient. This is primarily indicated in the blunt trauma patient that's unstable. And we're going to be looking at three areas of the body. We're going to be looking at the abdomen, the heart, and the lungs. <coughs> we're going to use the curvilinear probe or a microconvex probe. This is the best probe for this because we can, it gives us a big enough footprint to see and it also penetrates deep enough that we can see these areas of bleeding. We're going to look at that there are six primary windows of the eFAST exam, and we're going to focus on the first four primary views that were part of the original FAST exam, with views five and six being the extended portion, and we'll discuss those towards the end of the lecture. In the right upper quadrant, we want to place the probe in the mid-axillary line at the subsiphoid level. We want to be able to identify fluid both above and below the diaphragm. Above the diaphragm, we're going to be looking to identify where the diaphragm is in correlation to the liver and then fluid near the spine. Below the diaphragm, we're gonna recognize that fluid collects on the inferior tip of the liver. And from there, it will dissect up into a paddle-renal space or Morrison's pouch. Regardless of which organ is injured in the supine patient, the right upper quadrant is your most sensitive view for detecting free fluid. After Viewing the set, the right upper quadrant, we want to move over to the subxiphoid region. We're going to rotate that probe and have our probe indicator towards the patient's right. We're going to use the left lobe of the liver and direct our probe up towards the left clavicle. And we're going to look for fluid to collect between the right side of the heart and the left and the left lobe of the liver. After evaluating the subxiphoid space, we're going to move the probe over to the posterior axillary line in the left upper quadrant. Because the spleen is smaller, we need to move the probe more superior and more posterior. It is important to note that in the left upper quadrant, we're going to see fluid at the poles of the spleen first, and then it's going to track above the spleen or superior to the spleen. We seldom see fluid collect between the spleen and the kidney, and this is due to the uh, splenic colic ligament, which does not allow fluid to typically go down into our what's called the paracolic gutter. Moving on, we're going to evaluate the uh, lower abdomen by placing the probe in the midline with the probe marker towards the patient's head, just superior to the pubic bone. We do want to identify the bladder, but we need to keep in mind that the bladder is a pelvic structure, and so we actually want to see fluid superior to the bladder in the intraperitoneal space. We're going to move from here and talk about where we see these things on sonographic anatomy. On the left side of the screen, we'll have normal on each one of them, and on the right, abnormal. As we go through each pathology, they'll each be circled in red, and then we'll review that quickly with that off so you can see the image um, without markings. So if we look over in the pictogram up above, we can tell that this is liver in this area. This is our hepatorenal space, and here's kidney. Additionally, we have the spine line coming through here, which disappears into the diaphragm. When we look at this abnormal side, we can see spine line come through here, our diaphragm is angling up, or this curvature, but we notice that the spine continues. This is a spine line sign, and that indicates to us that there's pathology in the thorax. And in this case, it's a small amount of hemothorax. And although small, this can indicate to us an area that needs to be watched. Also, in a patient, we can also identify very large amounts of hemorrhage and can indicate the therapies that need to take place. Additionally, in this view, we're going to start paying attention to the hepatorenal space between the liver and the kidney, looking for fluid. If we evaluate this in another patient, we can see that this can be quite subtle. It, this can just be a sliver of fluid, and it can be hard to identify, so it's important that we uh, do this dynamic exam and evaluate the entire space. As mentioned previously, 
The inferior tip of the liver is the most sensitive area in the right upper quadrant. This is where fluid is going to collect first. This is often referred to as the pericolic gutter. And from this, the space, from this space, it will start to dissect up through the hepatorenal space as we start it, see, we see it to start to do here. We're going to go ahead and take a look at a video here, and we're going to just see how subtle this fluid can be. Large amount of fluids are easy to find, but this small amount of fluid uh, can be quite difficult to detect, and so we want to fan through this area. We want to look through it extensively to identify any anechoic structure, and as you can see, it's occurring right through there. When we move to the subxiphoid region, what we often see, as we can see in the pictogram up here, is that the liver is right up against the right side of the heart. We can see that in this diagram. We have the liver right here, and then the right side of the heart is throughout this part, and we can detect fluid in this space. I'm gonna go through each one of them, but I want you to identify that there's a large amount of area here that's separating the two. So we first see the liver in brown. It does look abnormal to us. That may indicate to us that there's injury in the abdomen. But then we see the heart below it, and then we see these two anechoic spaces, and then this area that's hypoechoic. And what that is, is that is hemopericardium with clotting blood. We'll go back to a live video so you can see that. And this is that you can see, notice that the clot is moving around. This may indicate to us which injury we need to address first when uh, resuscitating our patient. As we move to the left upper quadrant, we're going to again identify the spleen and the kidney. We really want to identify the spine line and get into the diaphragm so we can identify the pathology. When we look at the abnormal side, again, we can see spine through here. The blood is collected in superior to the diaphragm. We have diaphragm through here, and then we have this hemoperitoneum superior to the spleen. Because the probe marker is directed towards the patient's head, this is superior or cephalad, and this is caudal. Notice that there is only a scant amount or a sliver of fluid between the spleen and the kidney, but I would like you to appreciate how much fluid there is superior to it, and this is where we will first see fluid collect. If we go to more of a subtle view, we'll notice fluid here at the inferior portion of the spleen and lateral, and then we'll see one here uh, in the superior portion. Again, there's not, here's our kidney, and there's no fluid between the kidney and the spleen. When we go to even a more subtle view, we can see fluid is collected at the inferior tip of the spleen here and the superior portion, medial portion up here. Again, there's no fluid uh, between the spleen and the kidney. We would be looking for that fluid to extend over the top of the spleen through this area. As we move to the suprapubic area, it's important that we identify where the bladder is and we're going to look superior to that. Again, the probe marker is towards the patient's head, so this is superior or cephalad, and this is caudal. Because our peritoneal reflection comes down and goes over or superior to the bladder, we're going to be looking in this area for fluid, and we can see that there is hemoperitoneum collecting in this patient. If we look at a female patient, again, we're going to identify the bladder. We will want to identify the uterus, and then we're going to look for fluid superior to that uh, uterus, again, this being the superior portion or cephalad portion. We can see fluid through here and here. Now our secondary objective, as we mentioned before, uh, is the extended portion of the EFAST exam, and that's to evaluate for a pneumothorax. When we look at this area, we will place the probe in the midclavicular line with the probe marker towards the patient's head at about the level of the nipple or just superior to that. This is kind of the dome area of the chest, and this will be the most anterior area on the supine patient. We know that chest x-rays are not good at detecting uh, small to moderate sized pneumothoraces in patients that are supine, but by using ultrasound we can detect that. So what we want to do is we're going to look for this pleural line up here. So the pleural line is the bright line where the visceral and parietal pleura come together. As the uh, visceral pleura fills with air, that causes it to move along the uh, parietal pleura creating a kind of shimmering effect or a movement of the pleural line. When we look over towards the abnormal side, we can see this bright line right through there. And if we focus on that or this one here, we can notice that there is no sliding or no shimmering of that. Um, this does not necessarily rule in 100% that there is a pneumothorax, but it can indicate to us in the right patient that a pneumothorax is likely. 
The presence of lung sliding does rule out a pneumothorax in that location though. It's also important that we can uh, evaluate the cardiac function. This can be important as this can guide resuscitation of, by having an understanding of the cardiac function. And in a worst case scenario may uh, be the view we want to obtain to see if there's any signs of life in our patient that's been involved in a tra traumatic event. I just want to remind you as we finish up that a well-performed EFAST exam will increase the sensitivity and specificity and will improve the quality of the exam, further guiding resuscitative efforts.